three, two, one. Hello there everybody, this is Chris Schmidt from Rocket Lasso and I've got another tutorial for you today. Actually, uh, it's a tutorial in three parts. We are going to be tackling creating wrinkles with cloth, specifically the soft bodies inside of Cinema 4D. This started out as a question during Rocket Lasso Live, a weekly live stream I do all about answering Cinema 4D questions live from people in the audience. It's really fun. I've actually tackled this question several times before, but I figured let's try again, see if we can go a little deeper. And we were able to go way deeper than I thought. So I continued exploring it more and I wanted to get that knowledge out into the world so that other people can make really cool things. And I'd love to see how far this could be pushed. So there are three parts, like I said. The first part is the basics of it, getting it working very quickly and then kind of a way of testing everything. The second part is a more practical application of it, revealing an object. And then the third one is the most advanced where we're going to try and cover a car with very specific art-directed wrinkles and then pull it away. And each one gets a little bit longer and each one is definitely more detailed, but at least check out the first one. I think there's a lot of good details and I just want to see what everybody can make from it. So uh, let's dive right on in. I've got Cinema 4D R21 open. You'll be able to use, do these techniques way back. I think as long as Cinema 4D has dynamics, you'll be able to do these techniques. I guess when the aerodynamic added, that's like version 13 or 14. So you should be clear going way back. Now we're gonna start out by building a test scene. We want to be able to play with our dynamic properties and figure out the formula that we can control. And that way, when we actually start putting this on the actual objects we want, and it's going to take longer to calculate. We've already done lots of tests. We understand how it works. Along those lines, I will create a plane. NB. So we got two shortcuts I'll be using often here. NB will show polygons. And A will change our display mode. Just going to these different display modes, shortcuts. And B will show us polygons. All right. Subdivide this 40 by 40 on height and width segments. And I don't want this just to be gray. So let's make the simplest material ever. Make a new material by double clicking in the material manager drag over our material editor, turn off reflectance, inside color, create Fresnel, make the white color red. And this shouldn't go quite all the way to black. So I'll click a little bit before the black and drag over a dark red. Excellent. So we got a very simple velvet color. It should pop really nicely from the background. So there's our plain, call it cloth, keep it nice and clean. Then we need this to have something to collide with. We, create a, we could create a floor, but let's make it a little bit nicer make a cube and I want it to be below the cloth. So that can go to negative 100 would be exactly the number. Let's say negative 105. So it's a little bit further below and let's make this wider than the object. Let's say 600 by 600. Excellent. So just a little table for, uh, to hold our cloth. Now we don't want this cube. Let's even rename a table. Why not? Let's, uh, Add a dynamics tag on table, simulation, collider body. Immediately, I'm going to tell the collision, in the collision tab, there's shape. I don't want it to be automatic, even though that might automatically pick box. I want to make sure that it's on box. By clicking on some of these very manual shapes, you can make sure that Cinema 4D is very mathematically accurately calculating that these should not be intersecting. So that is set to box. And what else do we want? Well, no bounce and lots of friction. We'll just leave it at the default of 100. And you know what? I don't want any collision noise. Excellent. Now, moving on to cloth, let us add a simulation soft body. No bounce on that. And once again, very heavy friction. The shape on this does have to be automatic. It just means that it's going to, well, I guess it's not technically automatic. It is a moving mesh is what it's going to be assigned. Um, so we can say moving mesh. That's fine. Just to be very definitive, no collision noise. We don't need that. Now, right now you just see it's not bouncy and there's lots of friction. We haven't gone too crazy yet, but I, we're just going to type in some very specific numbers here because I've played with soft bodies a lot and I've ex in the past, and I've especially played with them a lot in prepping this tutorial, I'm just playing around because it's been really fun. And let's just set some default numbers here. And then later we'll start going into a lot of detail of what these different settings do, but let's just get it to begin working. So under on our cloth, under soft body, let's grab our structural damping and put that to zero. Our shear damping, put that to zero. Flexion damping, put that down to zero. And then grab shear, set that to five and flexion, set that to five. Excellent. Now we've got our default setup. 
the last thing we need to do to make it do something so we can actually see it happen is rest length. Let's say that it's got five frames. Well, let's even hit play. We'll hit play, boom, it falls on the ground. Nothing too exciting. Let's even turn on SSAO. So at the time of five, let's record the rest length. It's at full scale at this time, 100%. Actually, you know what? Before I record that keyframe, you hit undo or hold down control and shift and you click it, it'll delete the track out. Uh, I'm going to go to control D or command D and go to key interpolation and make sure my scene file is set to linear. I want these to be straight, straight lines when I record. I don't want them curving and easing in and out. So that's set to linear. Now at the time of five, rest length is 100. I'm going to give it 45 frames, which means we're going to jump up to the time of, I guess, 50. And then I want the scale to double. So I'll type in 200% on the rest length. Now what the rest length does is it's just the scale of the model. What is the calculation size? It's very important, I think, at the time that we record at the beginning that the scale has to be 100%. Otherwise it's going to, if it's not 100%, it's going to try and scale immediately to that size. And we don't want it to do that. We want it to slowly ease into a new one. That way it can just calculate smoother. Excellent. And you know what, before we even hit play, before I forget, when we're doing a lot of, I always feel like the dynamics in Cinema runs a little bit slow. It always feels a little bit floaty. So I like going back to our project settings, Control D or Command D under dynamics, going to our time scale here and changing that to 150%. So it's just a little bit faster than usual. So with all that set up, looking good, I'm gonna give the scene file a quick save because it's a nice place to begin. Cloth wrinkles. Excellent. Now, with all this working, let's go ahead and hit play and see what happens. If I hit play, it's going to start expanding and almost immediately you're going to see this explosion of wrinkles in the center, exactly what we're going for. So I definitely want to cover the basics of this very, very quickly. And as we keep going, we're going to get more and more advanced and try and understand more and more what's going on. But this is a great way of just instantly getting beautiful looking wrinkles. It's funny that we're doing cloth simulation, not using the cloth dynamics, but using soft body dynamics. But hey, what are you going to do? Now we can begin playing around and seeing how we can manipulate these settings some more. One thing you'll notice right away is that as this starts expanding, even though we have a lot of friction, it's sliding along the ground quite a bit. Look how much this kind of grows on the ground before it kind of explodes in the center. So let's begin by increasing our friction a little bit. We can select both of the tags under collision and increase the friction. Now let's try jumping up to 111, just make it a little bit stronger, a little bit above 100. Let's see if it still slides. And it does. So you know what? Let's go crazy. I'm going to double that double the friction to 222. Keep in mind those two numbers multiplying each other. So this is actually very strong. This is like four times the amount of friction, maybe a little more. So now when I hit play, nothing else has changed, but you can see that this is having a lot more trouble sliding. And when this explodes out into a bunch of wrinkles, it's happening all over the place, not just in the center. Now, why is all of this happening? Well, the straightforward explanation is all of these polygons are getting bigger but the gravity is pushing it down onto the box and there's so much friction that it doesn't have anywhere to go. And once it gets to a certain point, they just ha it has to go somewhere, it can't go down. So they pop upward and they begin folding over themselves. This is the basis of everything to do with wrinkles. So it's a, so boom, instantly we've got wrinkles. Everything from here is just adding more control and more style to it. Now, um, lots of things to talk about. First of all, our, Keep in mind, we made a default plane here. Cinema 4D likes calculating dynamic objects kind of at the default scale. So if you make a new scene file and you make a cube, that's about the size that Cinema 4D's dynamics like to work. Um, and this default subdivided plane is another scale that Cinema is very happy with. If you change the scene dramatically, your dynamics might behave differently. So I'm trying to leave everything kind of default scales here. Now, continuing, there's there's a lot of different details we're going to cover here, but moving onward into the cloth, you know, it's exploding, it's moving all over the place. You can see that the wrinkles are, uh, they're popping out all over the place and it's traveling. You see that we're passing through here a little bit, but I think if we zoom in closer, I guess they are passing through that uh, ground just a little bit, but no worries on that quite yet. We'll get there. So we get all these nice looking wrinkles. They're kind of traveling all over the place. We see that the wrinkles are at a certain scale. Now, the next thing to talk about is kind of the speed we're calculating and the way springs interact. 
the more subdivisions we have, the quicker, uh, the, the more subdivisions, the slower it's going to be. Now, we could always decrease the number of polygons. It's going to run a lot quicker. In fact, if I play, you can see that we're running with all the collisions happening about seven frames a second, of seven, eight, ten. Depends on how many polygons are colliding with other polygons. That's what slows it down. So you actually see the first few frames as it's falling are very quick. And then once it's ground, it suddenly slows down. So only where the collisions are actively happening are the calculations happening. Unfortunately, with cloth, everything's live all the time. So you don't really get to speed it up too much. Along those lines, something that's very important to note is under soft body, we're going to be manipulating mostly these settings, structural, shear, and flexion. And those are all springs. And springs are about how these individual polygons are interacting with each other. The more polygons that you have, if we cram more and more polygons in on the same size, these elements will behave differently. Because imagine right now we've got flexion, and that's how much something can can bend. It's kind of like you can imagine like a hinge, like here's one polygon, one big one here and one right here. And that the flexion is the hinge in between them. It's saying, how much can this bend? How much does it want to bend? Now, if we have, a, in this case, 40 polygons across, it's like, let's say that one can bend five degrees. It wants to bend about five degrees. And then that's five degrees and that's five degrees. You have to start adding up all those polygons as they go. But if we had a very low polygon object, drop this down to, let's say five by five, now there's only five springs connecting between those so they won't bend that much so the more the subdivisions are there the less flexion and shear that you need so an important element to keep in mind for of the basics now I'll click back on this diamond dynamic body soft body excellent so we're back here additional things for us to keep in mind well you can see that's looking pretty good it explodes we get some nice looking wrinkles a good rule of thumb I have found is to keep the shear and the flexion the same number. It's not it's not totally across the board, but you can get good looking defaults by doing that. Well, now, continuing to play, we can see the scale of the wrinkles. I have found that five by five is about as small as we can go. If that's any smaller, we just start getting chaos. So why don't we even check that? I'm gonna put this to one by one and we'll see what we get. So as soon as this starts exploding, you're gonna see that it's not exploding out in the, it's not exploding out kind of something coherent as a wrinkle. It's everything's popping up like this little pyramid, clearly not something we want. And if we increase this even to four, it still sort of does this effect. So five appears to be our minimum number. So that's as small as that number can get. And boom, we get the wrinkles. Okay, with that in mind, what else can we do to potentially uh, get smaller wrinkles from here. How much detail can we extract out of this? Well, um, something I found is structural can be pretty important, but there's a there's a push and pull on here. If we start increasing the structural, I'm going to double it. What structural is doing is saying how much can these polygons stretch? It can get longer on kind of the height or the width is what it's doing. So as we increase structural, it's saying these cannot stretch. If there's less stretch then they can't move away as far and you're going to see this explode and they're going to start wiggling even more. Um, honestly, it seems like these became these became bigger. These are bigger wrinkles. So let's try doing the opposite. Drop this way down. I'm going to go to, uh, yeah, we'll do 20. So a tenth of what we just had. Do the exact same simulation again. And now let's see what we get. Now, actually, but with the structure being so low, you see it's taking a long time for the wrinkles to be created. But when the wrinkles are created, you can see that they, they are a lot smaller. They're almost a lot more detailed. And the reason for that is these individual polygons are allowed to stretch. And if they're allowed to stretch, then they can kind of compress into a smaller space and they are allowed to kind of twist around each other a little bit more and we get more detail. Now, something to be clear with is yes, this looks very rough right now, but at any point we can create a subdivision surface and drop this inside. And you're gonna see that these will look like very, very nice looking clumps of wrinkles, very random and not even much in the way of a distinct pattern here. But very important to note is the subdivision surface can mess up the simulation calculations. In fact, it can entirely disappear. Let's see if we can make this happen. I'm gonna just hit play and it's gonna take a while. We saw it took some time to explode before, but eventually something should happen and boom, you see suddenly it just popped in. That's the subdivision surface doing that to us. So we're not going to do the calculations inside a subdivision surface, even though we will use it later on once we've baked it. And I was going to say something else and now I can't remember what it was going to be, but I'm sure we'll get to it. So let's keep an eye on the polygons and continue tinkering around. So those now have the ability to 
compress and stretch a little bit before they're being forced to explode. We want to keep that in mind. Um, but I, you know what? To tell you the truth, I don't want the structural to be this low. I want the polygons to maintain their scale. But there should be kind of a, a two different modes you're going to keep in your head. And it should be creating the wrinkles or the initial state and then a different mode of like, are we going to animate it afterward? And we'll see that in a little bit. So potentially we could say that the structure here could be at a different number, but then um, at the time of uh, animating, later we're going to be playing with springs. Once we start playing with the springs, maybe we change the settings at that moment, but don't need to worry about that quite yet. Now, leaving shear at this low number, I have, um, I don't know, we'll have to tinker because it's just too many numbers for me to keep in my head. But let's try tinkering around with these numbers some more. We're back to a default structural. Increase the flexion to, let's say 20, so four times as strong. Let's see what this does. Now we're back to the same structure, so it should be pretty strong. Let's see how coherent this is. Look at, do you see how we're getting all those interesting vibrations happening there? Do you see our individual polygons? They don't know where to go. The friction's not letting them go and they start fluctuating all over the place before it finally pops. And then we can see that we get all these wrinkles going. Now, these are some pretty large wrinkles overall. So perhaps I wanted to do this the opposite way. Let's change this instead to the shear being up to 20 and let's see if anything visually changes on this. Let it play and very quickly they pop up. And now look, with a higher shear, we're definitely getting smaller wrinkles overall. Now, we gotta keep in mind that we've added a lot of energy into the system by scaling up the overall shape. So it's trying to, you'll, you'll see that in the beginning, a lot of these wrinkles are kind of wafting around and it's kind of like, it's got all this compressed energy and it's trying to throw that energy out and eventually could throw that energy out by reaching the edge of our overall cloth. So let's keep that type of thing in mind. Uh, so yeah, we get these nice wrinkles they are kind of wrinkling and then the extra energy is escaping and eventually this will settle down. You can see it starts calming down quite a bit already. And if we let it go for a long time, eventually it will settle down completely. And that will be important for some of the effects that we're going to try and achieve later. Now let's talk about damping. What is damping? Well, all three of our spring settings here have damping. What damping does is it drains energy out of the overall system. So uh, let's, uh, let's go crazy here. I'm going to drain tons of energy out. 99% of the energy is going to drain out. So you saw how those were wafting through the air and they're pushing all their energy out. We're going to be draining that energy very quickly just by doing this on shear. And now exposing, you see these are not going anywhere near as crazy. And because they're not wafting around as much, all of these wrinkles are a lot tinier. All we did was change the damping and look how kind of stylistically different this clumping how different that looks. So damping is very important. However, unfortunately for some of the stuff we're going to be doing later, damping is bad. Damping can add a lot of influence in the areas that can be, can be really, can really mess up the overall effect. So we're going to avoid using damping whenever we can. Now this is kind of experiment because I don't have these all memorized, but I'm going to, now that we're in this position, try dropping our damping down to zero. And I want to see if this was barely moving. I want to see if this kind of suddenly reaccelerates or if it's kind of got that new position that's stable. So it actually it is, it is pretty stable now. So once again, like I said, we could use a bunch of that damping, let it get to a particular state and calm down and then take the damping out and then continue from there. So important things to remember. So with a relatively high shear, and I guess it's important to note what shear does. What shear does is enables a polygon to tilt side to side. The best way of demonstrating this, I'm gonna open up a new file and create a shear. So here's the shear deformer, put the curvature down to zero and let's animate or pull the strength. And this is what shear does in cloth as well, in, in the soft bodies. As I increase this, the polygon, imagine we're looking at a single polygon, that can tilt side to side. It also shrink, it, it'll pinch down as it goes, but uh, it's, a, it's an ability to tilt back and forth. So excellent. So one flexion is like a hinge and shear is that shear force. Excellent. So this is allowed to tilt and because it's allowed to like tilt over like that, it can bend in tinier ways. And that's what's enabling this to look a little bit more compressed. Instead of those giant wrinkles, we're getting smaller ones. Let's try pushing it even further just for fun. And once again, I will drain a lot of the energy out. I just want to see what this looks like. Stylistically, you just have to start playing. You see here that we've got, once again, some pretty small wrinkles. It's not terribly different from what we had before. 
Um, but yeah, very interesting. Uh, let's just leave the energy, the damping down and play. Now, I don't want to do too many tests along these lines because we could spend all day doing it, changing the numbers. But something I do want to point out here, well, let's add the spring in. I want to add the spring in here as the basic stuff before we start doing some more A-B testing. So you'll see that I picked 40 by 40, which means it's an even number, which can be cut in half, which simply means we have a point right here in the middle. So with that point in the middle, I'm going to create a simulate dynamics spring. So we've got a spring right here. Now I'm sad to say that I did not use springs for years and years and years and years. And it turns out they're incredibly powerful in cinema. So in let's see how they work. In this case, I'm going to drag our cloth into it. And immediately we can see we have a spring and it's going to the center of mass. Now what I want to do is attach this to a specific point. Two different ways of doing that. One is point selection in which we could make a selection and those points will be locked to it. But you have to make this editable to do that and we might change poly count. So we won't do that. We'll instead use polygon point, in which case we're just looking for a point index here. Here's the number, the specific point. So there's point one, two, three, four. Now we could figure out this precise number here, but instead I'm just going to keep on increasing this until we get close to our center point and increasing it more and more and more. Boom. And you see right there, we just kind of get this one ring that it, that's the spring compressed all the way. And that is now at zero, zero, zero. It's all zeroed out. So this spring is now looking to connect just to that one point. It's got a 20% region of influence. Tell you the truth, I don't know what that means, um, uh, what, it, what it directly drives. It's how much of a fall off it has. Now 20%, is that 20% of the model? I'm not sure, but 20% is a good default to, for us to work from. Another setting we need to worry about right here is the rest length. How long does a spring want to be? And currently the spring is zero. So let's click the set rest length and you'll see that yes, it is currently zero. That's what we want it to be at. If I were to hit play right now, all that's gonna happen is these middle points wanna stay in that particular position, but that's no fun. We want to see these animate. So that settles down pretty quickly. So let's increase our frames here in our scene up to 120. And jump our timeline. We wanted to settle a little bit. So I'm going to jump our timeline to about frame 70. Now I'm actually going to hold down the Alt key as I click. And what that does is it doesn't refresh the viewport, which means it's not trying to calculate any dynamics here. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to grab our spring, go to coordinates, and record the Y position. It's still linear. So at the time of 70, this is now at zero and let's jump up to let's say 105 and at 105 how big is this that's this is what's the width here i think it's four yeah 400 so we want to move it up into the air at least 400 let's move it up 500 so under coordinates at the time of 105 i want y to be 500 record that and now you can see the spring has stretched up excellent now we don't want it to play we don't want to hit play here because it's going to make it explode, but let's rewind and let the overall sequence happen and check out kind of the idea of we can create a wrinkle and that's going to be the first part of the sequence. This is just sitting, it might get a little bit weird there in the middle, but you can see that's going to create the wrinkles and then it's going to have a little bit of time to settle down, just enough to settle down a bit. And then starting at frame 70, we could start having some very direct control over the way this is, this is going to move. So we're now controlling this little region so when we hit play and we continue, you can see the spring is going to move upward. And as it moves upward, you see the entire piece of cloth is being dragged up into the air. Excellent. Very good position. Let's give this another save. Cloth, actually, let's just say save incremental. I've been trying to get into that a little bit more. So saves incremental. We've got a spring that is now going to directly control the way that this is moving. Excellent. Now we can keep on going and testing this a little bit, but what I wanted to point out is the way I like doing tests is A-B testing. And it's very difficult to A-B test animation like this. So something that's pretty neat would be, I'm gonna select the spring, the cloth, and the table, copy it, paste it, hold down shift, and 
now scoot it over. I'm going to try and get it to exactly, let's say 600. No, it's being difficult. 650. There we go. Just a little bit of separation there. Now we've got two of the exact same setup here. And if I hit play, they're not necessarily going to be identical, but they're going to be pretty dang similar. So any change that we, we can make changes to one and see how it compares to the other one. Now our frames per second isn't amazing right now. You can see that it's dropping down to about four. We've got a lot going on. And it's going to get even more complicated, but I still think this is going to be a pretty good setup. Yeah, not identical, not the same wrinkles, but you can see it feels the same. So with that in mind, we can do a little bit A-B testing. So I'm going to cut the top one, this cloth one, the one on the right is going to be the one we do with experiments on. So there's our baseline. Here's our experimental one. So let's try changing just one setting at a time. Um... We don't ever want to use stiffness in this kind of setup. Stiffness is telling every single point to return back to its original position, like no matter where it is. So we don't want that. And so along those lines, let's try increasing structural up to 200% and hit play. Changing these numbers shouldn't slow anything down, but let's see, that's exploding out. You see that it feels like this has uh, got a lot more travel. It's just bigger overall, which is interesting. Let's try pushing that a little bit further. I'm going to jump this all the way up to 500 and with that in mind, let's see what happens. Now, okay, now it's become very, the structure is very, very, very strong. It's saying you guys are not allowed to bend. You're not allowed to stretch or compress at all. So very quickly, you can see the wrinkles start to emerge. You're not allowed to move. Meanwhile, over here, this is starting to stretch, but it's within the tolerance of the structure. Thus, it's not exploding as quickly. So with that in mind, we can see that this one is now activating a lot faster. Um, so yeah, that definitely made a difference. And the cloth is not stretching as much, which in general, I think is a good thing. We don't want cloth to stretch because each polygon stretches a little bit and suddenly the cloth gets super huge. So whenever we can get away with increasing structure, that's a good thing. Now, once again, we're AB testing, but let's say we now, let's say we like that. I'm going to jump this one also up to 500. Let me also say this is important. 500 is about as high as you can go on structure. In fact, these should be pretty much identical now. So on our second structure, I'm going to jump this up to, let's go higher, 2,000, which is only four times higher, not an insane number. But let's see if we can actually get this to happen. What I find starts happening is it introduces so much energy and so many vibrations that it never calms down. It'll just keep on shaking and shaking and shaking forever. You see, this one's got a little bit of coherence and this one is still fluctuating a lot now eventually our springs are going to yank these up um but yeah you have to be careful there and there could be additional settings that change actually the shear is up pretty high it's up higher than i thought it was so i'm going to rewind these select both dynamics tags let's put the shear to five just like i said baseline five and five and now we've got the 2000 there i'm not sure if we'll see a difference here but i'm just trying to point out the things i've bumped into you can see immediately that one's oh look at this one start going crazy without the shear it's like compressing itself really small it's just freaking out um, now that one is as well a bit um but once again playing with the combinations that's the entire point of this part now let's grab both of them put the structural to 200 which seemed to be stable but on this top one everything's identical on this top one let's put a lot of energy drain i'm gonna do a damping of 99 percent an increase. Let's see if we get anything different. So let's see. Oh, okay. Definitely something different. This one's got a whole explosion happening. And then this one, in spite of being identical, is nowhere near as it's, you can see it's slowly expanding out. And then we got these smaller wrinkles. Now we actually can push this, I think the damping beyond, we can jump up to, let's say two, 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 and now it's gonna be draining even more energy out. And Actually, yeah, I think that's what, maybe I was switching those two numbers by accident, but I'm going to do a damping of 500. Maybe that's what I wanted to do. So now we've got a structure of 200 and a damping of 500. And now this is draining tons of energy out. And now you can see that these wrinkles are emerging, but you can see that it's not, they're not twisting all over the place. And you can see that we've reintroduced these tiny wrinkles. And I think that's, that's a good thing. We've got high structure, uh, and we're not animating anything, but we do have that damping and damping is bad. So, but once again, just by changing that one number, just by changing damping of all things. So you see, yeah, that's the only number changed. Look at how different these look. And especially if we were to grab this one and drop in the subdivision surface, like look how tiny these wrinkles are versus how big that one is. Well, just a, once again, good test. Um, okay. Anyway, let's, the important part here is that you should tinker around with the different settings. Now, um, Let's go back to damping being zero or 100. They're equal now. Now, 
I want to point out how important it is to play with aerodynamics. So we've got our aerodynamics. Uh, the first thing to do is turn on two-sided. We have a, a flat plane, so we want the wind to affect the top and the bottom. We want this to kind of travel through the air, cut, cut through the air. So turning on two-sided and on one of these, let's jump it up to 100% and 100%. And that's all we're going to do. One's got lots of aerodynamics and the other doesn't have any. Besides that, they're identical. I don't think we're going to... Actually, we might see a difference right away. So let's see what we get. So that's just a spring in the center point. But now they're going to explode. They're doing their own thing. And now, in spite of every other setting being identical, the drag is introducing a lot of slowdown. So where this is trying to dissipate their energy, this is forcing the energy out from the system. So you can see immediately that we've got these really nice wrinkles, no damping, but, uh, you know, and you know, with the tinier scale. And I always think these tinier wrinkles are better. It's easier to get big wrinkles than small ones. So that immediately is a good thing. But let's let this continue until we get to the time of 70. In fact, we'll zoom out a little bit as you these get pulled up and let's check out the difference when the spring begins to pull them upward. So right around now, it's going to start moving upward. We see the center point on both begin to pull and this one very smooth overall. So a little bit difficult to AB test, but look at how clean this one is. In fact, let's pause this and look at some of the different things that are happening. Some of the different properties. This is creating a very straight line overall. It's kind of tugging everywhere and pulling uh, at this part, we see this is maintaining, first of all, a lot more of its wrinkles, but there's more of a curve to it. I guess there's some curves going here, but I've done a lot of testing and the lift and the drag introduce a lot of curves where the, the path that this wants to travel is where the previous polygons had traveled. So let's let this continue. We'll probably need some more frames, 140, not too many more. These will get continue getting yanked upward. In fact, that might be, oh, that's as far as they go. So we actually want those springs to go a little bit higher. So easy enough to fix. Spring, spring, 105. Hold down Alt as I jump to that time. And you see the keyframe didn't update, but we already know 100 wasn't enough. So let's do one, or I guess it's 500, but I'm going to do 1,000, double the height. I think that's fine. Rewind all the way and let them play. Uh, exact same thing. It should happen. A lot of time for pre-rolling. Everything's exploding. Lots of energy dissipation here. Very nice clumping, and it's settling down very quickly. So automatically, two points for a drag and lift, as far as that's concerned. And then we get to the time of 70. And at that point, it begins lifting. Very nice and clean. You can see that the polygons are stretching back to their previous position. All the wrinkles are sort of disappearing as it goes. But this is maintaining... Oh, no. I don't know if I paused or if I should have uh, let that... Uh, <laughs> we, well, we exploded cloth. That's not an uncommon thing. Cloth, uh, not cloth, but uh, soft bodies can explode. So that seems to be what happened. I don't know if it happened because I paused or clicked. I don't think that would happen. But along those lines, there's not, I mean, all we, all we could do is slow it down a little bit. These springs are perhaps traveling a little bit quickly. In fact, I'm going to say that they should start traveling 10 frames earlier. So it's going to make them travel slower. Let that go. I'm actually glad they exploded because we need to see the different problems that might happen. And if everything just works the first time, you can't troubleshoot it. So these travel, it's going to be starting 10 frames earlier, and hopefully the slower speed will enable them to not explode. But if they do, then we'll have to add some extra sub, some steps per frame on the dynamics. So you can see I've got them selected. You see the two springs pulling upward. It rotating like that doesn't really make any difference. So that one is definitely exploding, which is unfortunate. Now, um, something I found, if you, the best way to pause it when it's exploding, which it is right now, is just to click the pause button or the play button and have it pause. And eventually it should work its way out. You see there, it just took a second. If you click it and you're not sure if you clicked it, and you're not sure if you missed it, a good trick you can do is just hit Control or Command R to trigger a render. You can actually see it exploded huge. We're inside of a giant piece of cloth right now. If you hit Control R, you've told cinema like, Hey, stop any process you're doing and render the current frame. So it'll actually stop it from playing. So that's a way you can be confident that it has stopped it. Now it could still take quite a few seconds for it to actually stop, but that's why I've been doing a lot with these tests is making sure that I hit control R and do a render. Now it's still exploding. So unfortunately I didn't want to do this, but well, a couple of things we do. First of all, our time scale is going faster, which is almost 
it's almost like making it do half again as many calculations in that time. So while we're just doing these A-B tests, let's try dropping our time back to 100 and see if it can handle that. That's almost like adding uh, a couple extra stub steps to it. So calculating a little bit slower, we can still see the same stuff. Very stable here, some nice bigger wrinkles here, but just by adding a lot of drag, that's working fine. And once again, all we're doing here is scaling up the cloth, which is just so cool. I can't believe it, it works as well as it does. So everything's getting pulled upward. Come on, don't explode. Now, okay, I, do you see this really nice curve we're getting from that? And you'll see as these bits of tail are pulling, those are kind of like just, just flopping over, but these are trying to travel that same path that the rest of it got pulled in. And look how much more pinched this is. You can, I mean, I, this just feels, that feels like an opt octopus, but this feels more like a, like a thicker piece of cloth getting pulled up into the air, working very nicely. I'm quite pleased with that. If we let this continue playing through, I want to reframe this. Continue letting this play through a little bit, then we can even see there's a lot of differences in the springiness as well. This is traveling through the air, but there's a lot of drag, a lot of lift. Meanwhile, this one has all this energy, so it's overshooting before it goes to try and settle down. I think this one will settle down a lot quicker. So the point being, we now know how to control our cloth using springs. We can tug it in a particular direction. We can make it stiffer, we can start creating the wrinkles. All of that is working really well. And I highly recommend this kind of A-B test. Set up a simple scene, do it kind of at these default scales, and then you can start dialing in exactly what these settings do. And I, like I said, I can give you a rest, you know, recipes that I've played with, but I've used dozens of them and done different renders with them. And every single one is a little bit different than the one before. But can't beat this A-B testing. Let's just do one last one, and then we'll move on to actually trying to apply this onto an object. So um, along those lines, I will just delete, because I like the way that aerodynamics looks over here, I will just delete the one I don't like and copy the one I do. In fact, I don't even have to delete it. If you drag a new one, it'll override the old one because an object can only have one dynamics tag. So they're identical. Now we could just play around by changing different settings like the damping. Now, actually, this is a good opportunity to show you on the top, the, the top one, the experimental one, uh, show you what the damping does. I'm going to add, let's just add a lot of damping on both the shear and the flexion. Now, that should drain lots of energy out, but you're going to see once we get to the time of 70 that, and actually, yeah, lots of differences here. You see, but with that flexion in there, this cannot bend anymore. It's draining the energy out too much and it can't bend. Um, so there's actually not any wrinkles really being created. So something important to keep in mind, but that's not why I wanted to show you. I wanted to show you the bigger problem with having any damping, this is just an extreme version of it, is once this starts getting pulled into the air, you can see that this is going to start stretching very nicely. But on this one, look at how all, see how these points are staying on the ground? But look at these. These are starting to move up into the air. I don't know exactly why that happens, but you can see how this entire structure is getting yanked up. And the, the, nothing is touching the table anymore, I don't think. If we go down here, you see the whole thing's hovering definitely not the kind of behavior that we want to have happen. So very important to keep in mind there. Now, go back to the beginning. I just wanted to point out the big problem with that. It took me a long time to understand what was going on there, but it is all the damping, damping's fault. Um, now, I, if you don't want too much stretch, you can, of course, do more structural. We're doing a lot of drag and lift. So, you know, you don't have to go that crazy. We can set the 50-50 and that's that is still on our experimental one. So we hit play, everything's identical except for different drag and lift. And I think it's just gonna make it not pinch in quite as much. So with that in mind, let's let this go through. Very similar wrinkles. This one seems to be expanding a little bit, but that makes sense. It's not draining the energy out in the same way, but they're still pretty tiny wrinkles, which is good. It's a good kind of combination of the two. And now the tug begins, gets pulled up in the air. And we have to keep in mind that as, as nice as it is that we get that curvature tugged in here, and you see that that feels like it's curving more than that one. That's a little bit straighter. But with less drag, I think we'll get a little bit more bounce at the end when the cloth reaches the top. And let's see what, let's see if we do indeed get that. So everything's getting pulled up. You can see that this one's traveled further along, but it is still kind of tapering in. It's following that curve a lot. A little, a little drag and a little lift actually go a long way. 
but let's see. Give it a few more frames. Lots of collisions happening, so you can see it's taking a little bit longer. We're only getting half, it's taking two seconds for one refresh. Um, but you can see already, look how much higher this is shooting up into the air. And I think that this is just gonna give us a lot more bounce. And it, like, just look at the way these wrinkles look. I like the way this is clumping up better, but it's this is stylistic. If this is a wet rag, like that feels more like a wet rag. Uh-oh, spring's freaking out a little bit up there. Um, yep, there it goes. Um, so a couple opportunities we have here. Well, things we should talk about. First of all, I hit pause here, but I'm gonna hit also, well, okay, I was able to pause it, but once again, hit render if you have to and stop it, then rewind. Okay, now, if you're gonna start getting exploding cloth, it's very common. The most, the uh, thing of, uh, it's a very brute force method, but if you hit control or command D, go back to your dynamic settings under expert, there's a setting called steps per frame. And if you start increasing this number, it is gonna make everything calculate way better, but it's gonna take way longer. If we double our steps per frame, it's gonna take twice as long for a frame to calculate. But I pretty much guarantee that's gonna stop that from exploding because it's, it's, take, it's doing twice as many calculations. It's actually steps per frame, which means it's taking each frame and before it's saying between zero and one, kind of go one fifth of the way and do that calculation. And one fifth of the way and do that calculation. Now we're saying, divide that by 10, go one tenth of the way of a frame and do that calculation. So we have now doubled the amount of calculations we have there. I would like to do one more AB here just to show you. I'm gonna copy the tag over again. It overwrites the old one, holding down control, it did that. And then under soft body, we were talking about shear and what shear did when it stretched up and that allows it to bend over and pinch. That's the main thing that I think is letting this stretch really long. So along those lines, I want this to be a lot bigger. I'm going to, let's go crazy. I'm gonna say I want a shear of 50. It's a really big number, but now it's a lot stronger and it doesn't want to, to shear. It doesn't want to tilt over as much. And let's just take a look at what that does for us. Because given the overall setup that we have now, I think that this gives a really nice pull. I probably went overboard, 50 is a pretty big number. But let's see what we get. First of all, we get the explosion. Um, these wrinkles are bigger. You know, see, these are definitely a little bit more pinched. So that changed that. But let's keep this going. It's not, uh, they're not too much bigger. And stylistically, I don't know if you want bigger ones or smaller ones. Uh, also keep in mind that the scale that you have your rest length though, is going to have a huge impact on how much this stuff clumps up. But I guess at the end, those look too different from each other. Definitely bigger though. Okay, and now it's gonna start tugging them upward and we are at the, it's taking twice as long to calculate. So uh, as these get pulled up, you'd see that this is getting pulled and let's see if I can pause it a little bit and show you a huge difference that's happening right now. You'll see on our new one, you see how this is forming a diamond shape, but it's not very pinched. You can see it's very, it's still pretty square. If we go to the one with very low shear, look what's happening here. Look at how these rectangles are stretching more into this diamond shape. And if they stretch like that, they can, they're not, they're not getting like longer. The volume isn't changing on that rectangle, but what is happening is, you know, if that angle, if this is stretching that way, these are actually longer polygons at their longest point. So what that means is this should have way longer tails falling at the edge where this one is gonna maintain its overall shape a lot better. So I'm glad that that theory seems to be working. Let's let this continue pulling. Now one thing you, well, I guess it's kind of happening in both. We see we're getting some nice pinching here, like this very tight pinch, where here it's kind of overlapping itself a little bit more. And keep in mind, that's the only parameter we changed allowed to keep on pulling upward. And let's see what we get. Yep, you can see, look at how these are stretching a lot, but this, look at, like that feels so good. Look at that claw, it feels like like a towel being pulled up from the ground. It's not stretching. Look at how how long elongated that these are getting. It's, it's super crazy. Um, so yeah, just overall, I think that, that we've now got a nice formula for just some overall cloth here, which ends up being a shear of 50, but I'm glad we talked about the differences between them. And this one has, I guess maybe they're identical, but let's see if we get a little bit of bounce here, because I would like a little bit of bounce. And let's see if it explodes once it, the spring reaches near the top. Now, uh, it's not, it's not, the spring is being pulled down by the weight of this cloth. So I don't expect that spring ever to get to zero, but it's just kind of keep tugging and trying to get it close to zero. Now, interestingly, this one, just with shear changing, look, the top got up there quicker. So that's kind of interesting. So everything's flying up. It's flapping around a little bit. And let's let this 
go. Actually, you know what we should do is I'm going to let this one calculate so we can watch it in real time. So just so you don't miss anything, I'm going to jump this up to 155 frames. Just give us a few more frames, scale that up, rewind. And if you're not super familiar with cloth or dynamics, if I select this one tag, I'm going to go to the cache and then I can say bake object, but I can also click bake all. It's going to bake everything in the scene. So I will do that. And here's my meter. It's not going to take that long. It's going to take essentially as long as it took for this to scrub through. It's a couple extra frames, but we'll be doing this quite a few times throughout the tutorial, especially as we get to the more advanced ones. And I'll just skip over those and let you know about how much time it took. Um, so we'll do a little cut here. There we go. That is done. It took about maybe three minutes. Unfortunately, it's not a constant line. If it starts taking longer to calculate at a certain point in the timeline, that will also slow down a bit. The good part now, though, is we are able to see this in real time. Hopefully hit play and we can see that they wrinkle up looking great and then they get yanked up and then we can get that nice overlap. Um, you see it like overshoots and then like settles back in again. And it's just the way they're wafting and wrinkling. Like both of these look look really nice. I like the way this one finally settles down, but this one is getting the way it's pulled up. I like that better. I mean, you got to kind of pick and choose. You could always animate those properties, but there's a lot of tinkering to do there. And I highly suggest that you do tinker around. Now we're going to end this very soon as the end of part one. I highly suggest continuing into part two and three, because I'll go into a lot more detail and more specifics and way, more ways of art directing this. But I just want to go through kind of the complete process here. So we got one last step to do, I believe, which is it's baked now. And that enables us to output this. And I guess this does require R20 or R21. But Something that's very nice is being able to bake this out to something like Alembic. So in R20, then you can just right click on an object and instead of exporting the entire scene, of course you can bake it as Alembic. So I'm just gonna click that and let's just say that this is our main one. So that's gonna export very quickly. I can disable the piece of cloth that was there already. And now we've got the Alembic file running right there. But there's a several things that are great about the Alembic. First of all, we can put this into a subdivision surface and instantly that's going to smooth it and it's not going to have any problems doing that calculation. So hitting play, that should settle in and it's going to expand and it's playing the subdivision surface and it looks great and smooth and it's looking wonderful. Another thing to note though is we can't, let's say that we're doing a car reveal and we'll be doing that actually in one of the next segments, but it, you can't just yank the spring as fast as you want without cranking up all the sub calculations. Some, so something that could be really handy is speeding it up. Something that's wonderful about the Alembic file is we can speed it up. Going inside of the cloth, I can say, you know what? I want this to be double the speed and now when we rewind, rewind and hit play, that that is going to play twice as fast, boom, and jumps up into, you know, it's going to get to that final position a lot quicker. So the Alembic file is just enabling this to look really clean and it works quite well. I'm actually very happy with that. So you can see the very basics of getting some nice looking wrinkles and then pulling this up in the air. There's a lot of information that's going to be in the next segments. So please jump on into part two. I should be releasing all three at the same time. So that should, I mean, there's so many things. We could keep on just playing and playing and playing with these settings. They're a lot of fun. We could keyframe more settings all over the place. Um, this does work with some motion blur. I was doing redshift motion blur and it deforms beautifully. Um, if you want to give us some thickness, we can create a cloth surface. I usually, well, we can put the cloth surface after the subdivision surface. So it's going to be sharper edges. And actually, no, it's back. Well, it doesn't matter. It actually doesn't make a difference. I don't want to subdivide, but I do want to add a little bit of thickness. It's going to be a little bit hard to see, but if I zoom in, you see we can add thickness here. So we want to keep a light touch on that, maybe just a thickness of one, but it's nice to be able to actually give it that thickness, especially if you're kind of intersecting the object just a little bit. And that'll pull up and that should look very nice. And that is working wonderfully. And then actually an important thing to note, we didn't go too far in it, but... Uh, I'm going to have up on the Rocket Lasso Patreon, I'm going to have some uh, a fabric image that I rendered out, like this repeating pattern fabric image. We didn't build it in this one, but we'll build it in the next part. I just want to throw that out there. So I think that will wrap up part one here. Please, like this testing protocol, super fun. Just tinkering around. I've done hundreds of like running through the simulation and testing it and seeing how it looks. And hopefully I was able to distill the information in a relatively short time.
So there we go. That wraps up the first part of a three-part tutorial. We're going to get even fancier in the next one. We're going to be working with a spline or something extruded. So kind of like the way text would work. And the third part is about covering up a car and revealing that. And that one's even more advanced. So if you like this video, go ahead and hit a like. And I would love for everybody to come and join the Rocket Lasso community. We've got a Slack channel and you can follow on YouTube and Twitch and Instagram. Everything's at Rocket Lasso. And we do live streams every Wednesday answering Cinema 4D questions. It'd be great to see you there. And uh, I'll see you in the next part of the tutorial. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>